You want anarchy? Welcome to News from Underground, the best anarchist show out there on YouTube. Uh, today we have Isaac and Phil. And your local friendly anarchist, Cal Mulaney. We have uh, the announcement we're going to talk about first would be Secret Krampus. Secret Krampus will be this Friday, of course. It's our uh, way of uh, having fun with Christmas or winter solstice. Uh, there's a great movie on the subject. It's hilarious, uh, very dark comedy and kind of relaying. It's the kind of guy who used to ride with Santa Claus in the past, which was this guy who just actually doesn't do well with peaceful parenting. He, he, he beat children <laughs> and kidnapped them. So it was, uh, I guess, a, a legend that they would tell children to behave or otherwise Krampus will come after you. If you behave, Santa Claus will be there and, you know, give you the good stuff. Uh, but we have a secret Krampus thing this Friday. If you guys uh, want to come by, if you don't have any place else to go, um, come over here to the Shoshi Anarchy Garden. Uh, we'll have the details listed in the comments, well, in the description section below. Uh, and other than that, we have uh, our Amazon wish list. So winter's upon us. If you guys want to help us make the best anarchy show out there, uh, you can help us be part of the team by looking down and seeing the kind of equipment that we need to, you know, push the quality out there. Um, you know, we've been doing this now. This is our, on our fourth year, spreading anarchy. And so we have a great commitment. We're in this for the long haul. And it'd be great to uh, have you guys join us too and be part of the liberation of um, abolishing uh, government tyranny. And uh, yeah, so that's, so that's that. That you can find also in the description list. All right, so uh, first story for today. New poll shows many voters want to bomb Aladdin. Say goodbye to Arabian Nights. According to public policy polling, Triple P, a Democratic political polling group, 30% of Republican primary voters and 19% of Democratic primary voters support bombing Agrabah. So um, I want to bring up a few things about this. So uh, one thing about surveys, um, uh, public poli or public polling surveys specifically, is uh, there, are, there are always a lot of issues with them. So um, uh, the, for one, they have um, uh, sample errors, uh, participation bias, regional bias. So we have issues of, of some people volunteer to actually speak to the pollers and some don't. Mm -hmm. And the people who are likely to speak to pollers actually have a certain, uh, may tend to have a certain bias. Uh, similarly, regional bias, you can have uh, a situation where only certain areas are really um, being represented in these polls. So uh, I wanted to bring that up. Also, um, questions like this, questions like, do you want to bomb Agrabah? Things really ridiculous like that are often throw, thrown into polls like this to just check if the if the person that's that's filling this out or, or answering over the phone is actually paying attention. All right. So, um, and I, I think that's actually what, what this is, what this question was. Yeah, how is that a serious question? <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, clearly. Um, that's still, that doesn't make it any less concerning that people say yes to this. Right, right. <laughs> um, well, then that throws calls into the quality of people you're out there pulling. Yeah. Right. Oh yeah. Well, um, and realistically, I mean, if you got a phone call from a polar, would you answer the questions? I guess, uh, like during dinner times, like, oh yeah, yes, yes, no, yes. Do I get something out of this? Um, well, I guess when being polled, I'm going to assume that whoever's questioning me is asking legitimate questions. They're not questioning my intelligence. Uh, do you expect Agrabah to be bombed? Or... Right. That's <laughs> yes, actually of course. Something... I've heard of Agrabah. Yes, it should be bombed. It's an awful place. And it really is full of thieves. Yeah. And, um, it's right next to Uzbekistan, right? Yeah. yeah. You got all those monkeys <laughs> running around. Yeah. <laughs> flying carpets and e-regulation. Right. Oh, yeah. What about my roads? <laughs> what about these flying carpets? Yeah, you know we have to regulate hovercrafts. So. Right, yeah. <laughs> will that be, would the, will the flying uh, carpet be, you know, have to be registered to you? You know, it's a. Absolutely, right? it would be. <laughs> it's a flying, you know, uh, aircraft of yeah. some sort. Yeah. <laughs> that counts as a drone. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> right. uh, no, yeah, I agree. I think uh, the sampling errors of that is uh, kind of weird, and you can't really take a lot of this stuff as completely valid right but some uh, criticism towards that skepticism yeah so of course the um, the most of the news outlets focused on the Republican results the results from for the uh, Republicans and they said uh, 
you know, so many Trump voters um, go for bombing Agrabah and, and whatnot, but um, still 19% of the Democrats uh, answered pro-bombing Agrabah as well. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, other other questions ranked highly, and th this is really what what concerned me about this. Um, and, and these questions are: Do you support banning Islam as a religion? And twenty six percent of Republicans said yes, they do. Uh, do you support a national database for Muslims? Um, Forty six percent said they do, and. Even most, the most concerning for me was uh, with, you know, how things are today, looking back, do you support the policy of Japanese internment? And 28% answered in the affirmative, mm. that they support, that they would support Japanese internment. And how disturbing is that? I don't know if they actually know what that word means, internment. Then. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like oh, it's a Holloway getaway, you know, until we figure things out. Yeah, we can uh, hope so. But you can look at the age distribution, and the age distribution tends more towards the the older. Mm. So people who are alive during this this time period, who should know what that means, mm. are the people mostly voting for uh, you know in favor of this. Mm. Does this reflect a sociopathic tendency in our society, like the Stanford Prison experiments? You give somebody the power to answer a question like that, and they think that they have some authority to even. Think about that question: whether or not people should be interned. Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's but there is one uh, one good thing about it. One kind of brighter side of this is this did being as that skewed towards the older people. Um, that indicates that the younger generation is is moving away from that idea. Hopefully, right, right. Oh. I can see that. Um, hmm. That is a attached or uh, but sentimentality like that, uh, and of course, uh, like the justification for caging, throwing, throwing Japanese people in these cages, uh, what's it, for the good of the nation, national security, I guess. Uh, you have fast folk kind of, you know, mass fast folk. <laughs> um, what what is uh, the camp that they want to put everyone? FIFA camps, oh, FEMA, FEMA yeah. camps. <laughs> fast folk are college thing. Uh, one of the other F acronyms. Uh, good status joke in there, you know, your mother's so status, you know, she sends you to FEMA camps during the summer. Uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think uh, in terms of internment, I don't know if people can see the same thing as uh, concentration camps. Maybe that's the word they, they need to use, right, in these polls, you know, maybe Japanese uh, concentration camps rather than internment, you know, sounds kind of temporary, sounds, you know, we, we can't call it concentration camps because this is America. We don't do that because, you know, we're the land of the free and everything good. Right. Yeah, I often think some of these posts need to be better defined in some of the words that they use in uh, presenting these questions. Yeah. Uh, so another another bright, you know, kind of look out on this is, is that just who is the PPP, the, uh, the public polling uh, in the first place? They are pretty much recognized as a left-leaning uh, mm -hmm. polling place they they um, they're known for all sorts of ridiculous stuff like uh, they've they've asked about the approval rating of God uh, whether <laughs> whether people think that Obama is eligible for the rapture um, and we, we can't forget that they pulled North Carolina uh, it's actually uh, based in Riley and they polled North Carolina about who they would support for president, and Bees Nuts was one of the candidates they listed. <laughs> so, and um, just a little bit of a, a, a side note, they did not ask the Democrats about there you go. the internment or about the other Islamic issues. The only um, really weird question they asked the Democrats was the Agrabah question. There you go. Yeah, there's there's sort of biased, uh, you know, integrity in terms of uh, these polling issues that they put out there. Uh, mm -hmm. That's something you always kind of want to examine too. It's like, well, I see the numbers here and the statistics, but let's go to the source and see if you know they're actually objective in their findings. Um, are they impartial? <laughs> and of course, no, no, they're not. Um, yeah. A lot of this information in terms of statistics is just used to distract you or mislead you and further confuse you. Of course, this one trying to, you know, get you to shift and thinking Republicans are all like this, but of course. 
Yeah, they didn't even question uh, Democrats about the same same issues. Yeah, that's kind of, I guess that's to be expected, right? That's uh, what, yellow journalism. Journalism. That's uh, <laughs> uh, what what you get out of uh, that kind of media. So I guess we can chalk this piece up to propaganda, but it's not the first time I've heard a story like this. Even when it does relate to a real country, um, I don't expect the people answering these polls to be well enough informed to decide these sorts of things. And of course, they have no right to even consider bombing people who have not aggressed upon them personally. All right. <laughs> well, it's it's yeah. It, uh, also, to get a uh, a hint of this is if you watch Mike Dykes's uh, "Man on the Street" videos. He interviews people and asks them ridiculous questions like this, sure. like, do you support the male privilege tax or things That's like right. that? Uh, and he did some pretty scary answers. Mm. But, but I'm, you know, regional bias, uh, selection bias, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure he cuts out a lot of actual decent answers. I don't, I don't think people are really taking these questions seriously. Um, you're clicking on a little bubble on your screen and then probably being bombarded with the next ad. And so this is just something you're going about. You're not putting any critical thought into it. Right, right. I can see that. Uh, it kind of reminds me of like a lot of people sometimes will take these statistics and show like, well, look, males uh, are in favor of legalization of cannabis, uh, more so in comparison to their counterparts, females. And they rate like the number, like females are more in favor in its uh, criminalization versus males. And then people say, well, there you go. Males are more inclined to freedom than uh, females are. But of course, they don't tell you in the... Uh, discovery of some of these responses, they never tell them how about uh, instead of legalization or make it illegal, uh, none of the above, <laughs> having government not involved in any of those choices and decisions that have nothing to do with you, right? That's not your body, <laughs> it's none of your business. But that's never an option that's presented. It always has to be government one way or the other. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes when you look at these polls, it's like you really can't take it uh, seriously because uh, they don't present all of these choices that would be there, you know, your, I guess like in, in science, you have your, uh, your, your control experiment, <laughs> uh, different ways to kind of help verify uh, an actual response or the type of outcome that anyone would come in and define on their own. Um, but yeah, so you mentioned there was something about a, a Doug Casey thing you wanted to bring up? Oh, yeah. Um, so I wanted to kind of you know, ask, is, is Doug Casey right about people just being trained monkeys? I mean, was, what does this say about Americans? Right. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, that, that, that would just show me that, uh, you know, I, whenever people try to become these mythanthropic crummages and say, yeah, people just don't get it, no, they're just, uh, they're stupid, they're, they're monkeys. Uh, and then I just ask them, well, what's the relation of the anarchists in your life near you? Right? How successful have you been with that? Right? And a lot of people feel that it's so difficult to have these conversations that they just give up on everyone. And then you have these remarks of calling, uh, you know, calling them monkeys. And uh, that's, that's the result of these people who kind of for, have already given up on society, I would say. Uh, advocation of politics is the same thing. Voting does the same thing. You don't have to talk to anyone when you vote or involve yourself in politics. You just hide behind a confession booth. There's no community involvement or discussion within that. Uh, and then, of course, I think Doug Casey has his Argentina Noah's Ark project, which still has a lot of vacant land, still has a lot of uh, openings for people to still move there, and he's been kind of running that for years now. Um, so I wouldn't, look, I wouldn't look to somebody who doesn't have a, a large enough anarchist within this intermediate circle or within its own community to, to take him seriously when he calls everyone else monkeys. It just means that uh, he's just a poor salesman of, of liberty, is what I would say. Um, I would say that for anyone <laughs> when, when they make those remarks. It's not a respect for, I guess, human capacity to learn. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I think that's uh, yeah, kind of insulting for that in that regard. So we've shown <laughs> over three years now that people can understand the measures of freedom here. We have a great measure of success towards that. It doesn't have to be this one out of 10,000 people that can only get it. Uh, you know, we have a good algorithm. We have a great uh, way to kind of bring the community together and further, further spread the message. It doesn't have to be these tiny minority, rare few people. Um, and I think that's what Doug Casey kind of puts out there. Um, I think that's a fair point, but I would argue that both sides have their validity. I think it's important to recognize that even if you can get someone to agree to um, concepts of liberty, that doesn't necessarily mean that they understand all the implications or that they would necessarily employ that in their own lives if they aren't able to apply reasoning to 
you know, actually acting things out. I'd say that's not necess not not really necessary. Uh, that's not necessarily required. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you can get people pretty much on board, yes, you need you need the active. You need you know you need the people willing to act on on their beliefs, but you also need the people that are willing to not go against you. You know the people that are willing to at the very least be lazy rather than act right. against you. And I think that's you know that's good enough for some people. All right, uh, we're asking this to let go of the idea that violence will set us free. So even if they agree with that, and those conversations are recorded, and at least they agree with the immorality of the state. The other areas from that is to you know come join our freedom gathers. You know come learn more about this. Come learn how you can be further and consistent with your principles. Right. So that's the first step. But at least that's a step that Bill Casey believes that no one can get to. Right, even having the conversation. Sure. Right, uh, and he thinks that you're you're too stupid to even <laughs> to figure that out, and you can't have this conversation with everyone. They're monkeys, for God's sake, he says. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, they won't even come to uh, that conclusion that the government is immoral in any kind of conversation. Yeah, the other area steps in which how they can be involved more. It's um, it's a commitment that takes time. You know. That takes, uh, you know, we're introducing Anarchy 101. <laughs> Come to the Freedom Gathering, learn more about uh, Anarchy Level 200, you know, or 300 level, argument against IP. Yeah, I don't disagree with you at all, but it is a choice that the individual makes whether or not to go down the path of good and truth or to ignore these things and continue to live ignorantly. The way right. we, have that, we have that freedom. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. I think uh, the choice for them to follow it or not is to see if there's, you know, what, what do you have aside from this uh, conversation, though, right? Uh, if there's nothing that for them to go to, yeah, you know, it's very easy for people is to, you know, well, that was a great conversation, a good idea, but I'll just stick to what I was doing, right? It can't be like a magician that does this magic trick and everything disappears and then uh, they're, they're dumbfounded and then you don't help guide, you know, further errors and information, right? right? Um, so, yeah, I think it could be like that if all we did, like, well, yeah, there is no state. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do I do now? <laughs> yeah, I agree. This does lead us uh, quite well into the next topic of uh, China's, China's social credit. It's one of the most terrifying tools of authoritarian oppression I've ever read about, claims the video. Propaganda games, sesame credit, the true danger of gamification. The video continues. In the past, you observed such powers because you were afraid. The world we're stepping into involves positive reinforcement to promote subservient to the will of the regime. It's big brother, kinder, gentler hand. The video claims a system to make people enjoy falling into line. That is some scary stuff. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Uh, the, the, the system is ru rumored to reward and punish people through a credit scoring system based on their payment and purchases. So if the government doesn't like what you're ordering or you're ordering something that maybe it's uh, costing a lot of carbon <laughs> to be delivered to your door, that'll lower your score. So if you're buying local vegetables, that might be a good thing, and you're also gonna be rewarded in the system. Um, you can even be uh, rewarded or punished for posting your political views on the social media. So if you're saying something that goes against communist rhetoric in China, your score goes down. <laughs> praise, praise the fair, and uh, your score will go up. <laughs> so then those are the people you want to meet up with, the one with the lower scores then. <laughs> right, yeah, I guess so. That's exactly what I was thinking when I saw it. Yeah. That's one of the last components to this uh, reward and uh, punishment system is your friends list. So if you're hanging out with people with low scores, that'll also lower your score. Mm -hmm. um, you want to only hang out with good citizens, of course. Um, it leads to a better life. Yeah, the terrifying mm -hmm. thing is that this is uh, eventually going to actually be um, become punitive, like a, a an actual uh, required system that they that they put people through, yep. and they can punish people for bad scores. Yeah, so right now just, it's yeah. uh, all voluntary. So right now there's really no issue with it. People uh, love love this. It's a game. Yeah. Um, and I think the idea is to continue to. Um, implement this in all aspects of our lives. So you wake up in the morning and you get 10 points for using Colgate toothpaste on your toothbrush. Then you get another 10 points once you brush your teeth for three minutes and these rewards add up and they keep adding up. And it it's can't be Colgate. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> they have too many terrible, options. It's a terrible choice. 
Yeah. Um, but Colgate offers more and better rewards. So even though they have an inferior product, they, they get you in other ways. They help you in other ways. Uh, I guess I could see uh, some of this stuff working out in a free society, like a reputation system score. But of course, mm -hmm. this is this is a business that's trying to create, you know, a way for, you know, to give you points for doing good stuff. But of course, like all good ideas and all kind of business ventures, government always takes that and to use it for evil, <laughs> like what China's doing right now. Because mm. uh, if you have this sort of thing like uh, with credit credit scores, right? Are you can, are you credit worthy to, you know, are you going to pay back the loans, the money that you borrow and to make those payments, right? Or it seems like you have a history of not doing so. Um, I guess you have reputational uh, systems that could do the same thing. But in terms of like what you mentioned with China, China's trying to make you be blindly obedient to their propaganda and rhetoric, rhetoric, and that's trying to get the good errors in which it could be put to good use and just turning it to evil. <laughs> it's also moving it from relatively private to something that's going to be displayed on your social media profile and your dating profile. Um, and this could eventually happen automatically. So you create a dating system, a dating profile in China, and your score is automatically going to be set up there. Um, hmm. They already do that with, I guess, OK, keep it, right? You have your... <laughs> <laughs> How do they do that? <laughs> they, they, you have your percentage of like someone who is... Uh, right. I, I guess how you, you match how you match right your match right uh, which is in green and then right next to it says enemy <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you mismatch with a lot of questions you know <laughs> I guess you know who your doppelganger is uh, I guess that's someone you need to confront uh, I'm not sure how that works if you have like a hundred percent enemy um, I guess yeah I guess I see them just using like tools that businesses have been doing and now just getting ready to trying to see who's who's against government. Um, who's the radical out there? Dissident. This, this is something straight out of Brave New World. Yes. I mean, it's, just like, <laughs> it's like you take Brave New World and you take 1984 exactly. and have a baby and this is what you have. <laughs> you have modern day China. This is really terrifying. Ugly baby. Yeah. <laughs> Ugly baby indeed. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, um, this is like the Soma pass. You know, you, know you, you behave and you get some Soma. Except it's, you know, it's something almost more addictive, more, uh, more damaging is, you know, social, um, uh, social ostracism, you know, social ostracism is, has been, been seen to, um, be almost like torture, uh, like mental torture. And they're finding a way to really try to gear social ostracism in, in the favor of big government right. and in tyranny, really. And it's frightening. I think, uh, uh, El Douche, the uh, ruler in Italy. Um, Fitting name. Yeah, that, that's, that was his title, right? Or El Douche. Um, he had a, you know, they gave out rewards system for, for women who produced a lot of children. And they gave out rewards towards that, you know, for, for their fascist government. And so there's been in practice in the past of government rewarding people for good nationalistic uh, behaviors of that kind. Uh, I guess this is just uh, the 21st century version of the next step up towards that because uh, then it would it would, it would uh, hamper your ability to get uh, you know things done through a government's monopoly system right so like if you were to get a driver's license in China for example it will take you like a month whereas if you had great credit credit score you know you could take that care of there for you like in a day mm -hmm. right so yeah I it's uh, that's the area of use that they're thinking about putting it to it's a terrifying trend it's uh a version of B.F. Skinner's operant conditioning, and that's basically where the social controllers will set up a reward system, and every time you perform an activity that uh, produces a reward, you get conditioned to performing that, as opposed to whatever it is you would have chosen to do, just living your life as an individual. So they're setting up how you go about your day. Um, it's really the implications of this trend because we start off with a post on social media and eventually we end up, uh, are you going to bed on time? Um, just complete control. Um, good quotes from Skinner is, uh, with the right social engineering, we can create a new breed of human and change the environment and you can change the individual. So he was a behavioral psychologist. Um, and you can look up 
Um, an episode of Black Mirror is a sci-fi series uh, available on Netflix. They have an episode called 15 Million Merits. Um, it gets into the idea of gamification and people living in Skinner boxes. Hmm. Um, so that's something to check out if you're interested in the uh, impl implications of this idea, seeing how it could play out. Yeah, I've, I've actually studied gamification and they've found it to be pretty, uh, pretty effective. And and um, and gearing people's uh, people's actions and uh, in marketing, so and w which is of course where where all of this kind of roots out of. I mean, propaganda started as a marketing right. <laughs> thing, mm -hmm. but um, but the uh, uh, they've even gamified games now. Like if you go on Steam or, or or play a game on PS4 or Xbox, you get these rewards for doing certain things in games or playing a certain amount and it's it's they're gamifying games to encourage people to play more games because apparently the games of themselves weren't exciting enough they had to add uh badges and everything to that's it that's true that's true it's like crack it's kind of addiction for those points uh and i guess this sort of stuff uh, has ever been happening right You're, these are your public indoctrination camps mm -hmm. uh these are your kids in which uh, you're taught you know, from an early age that to have blind authority um, and blind, blind obedience to authority. Uh, never to question your, anyone with titles. And that's the thousands of years, thousands of hours, I mean, that they put children through to the ring of that. So, of course, when they get out, nobody questions government, nobody questions their surrounding, nobody questions some of the polls and these questions here. Uh, it's like, well, I guess this is the way life is, you know, this is the way it's always been. And so, yeah, you can do that through one generation, uh, what you're mentioning with Skinner. Uh, of, of human of human beings, just putting them through that wrong of those uh, indoctrination camps. Uh, in a free society, I don't think it could work that way, because in a free society, you don't have these public indoctrination camps that are, you have peaceful parenting that you always uh, tell the child, you know, when you grow up, always question everything. Question me, <laughs> no matter who they are. <laughs> mm. uh, don't be afraid. You know, if someone tells you that uh, you can't question this, someone needs to be concerned about. Um, That's what we hope, but our brains actually process these virtual experiences the same we would as if we went out and worked for something. We get the same uh, rewards going off in the brain. So uh, I think regardless of whether or not um, you're well-educated or naturally intelligent, these are physiological processes that people have gained better understandings of than we ourselves understand and might be able to manipulate us subconsciously you know, that, that I agree, right, 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 that I agree, uh, but in terms of like why it's so readily accepted today, like in China, for example, uh, you sure. have, yeah, <laughs> Oceania, right. uh, you have these, uh, in, these camps, which uh, blind allegiance to that sort of thing, I think it's what uh, helps, you have a good cattle of, of, of human beings. But, to but in today's that. world, you know, global trends can spread like wildfire. Um, I can see people, some people in America picking this up. I mean, <laughs> you see people playing games on their phones, Candy Crush. They, it's a uh, they have, they have already applied some of this because um, there was a game called Navy SOCOM on the original PlayStation that was actually um, built by the the military to desensitize people into um, joining the military. I mean, mm -hmm. making sort of glorifying war so that people would want to actually join up. Uh, I don't know what, what kind of success they had. I suspect not much because um, that type of thing has been shown not to be effective, but hmm. but they're already trying it out. I mean, it's it's they're already trying these types of, you know, uh, conditioning methods um, on the American people. So, and they're doing it in front of our faces. I mean, they're not even hiding it. Right. No, I'll, I'll still make the case uh, that a free society would be very difficult to do that. Uh, you're, you're raising human beings that are very critical of everything around them. That is not everything is because uh, I said so or because he said so because I have this arbitrary title or they're not like being hit, you know, smacked around for not asking questions. Um, and I think that maybe creates a lot of um, the miswiring in the brains that, of course, leads to this kind of different addiction to like these reward systems. That's like crack cooking for them, just uh, trying to get these uh, pleasure rewards that are artificial that they can't find elsewhere. Um, and, and we could also be, we could actually be experiencing accelerated physical evolution too, so or physiological e uh, evolution. So a lot of these methods that used to work, you know, in the 50s and 40s, look absolutely ridiculous to us now. 
Um, you know, a lot, a lot of the, the Eddie Bernays, um, a lot of the stuff that Eddie Bernays actually, um, you know, put out there, people, people can spot it, you know, really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. And be that, a, be that, you know, extremely accelerated, you know, physiological evolution, like epigenetic type stuff, or be it just simply, you know, us learning through seeing what, what happens in the past, it is still happening quickly and they have to really catch up to us. And I don't, I don't think they'll really be able to stay ahead um, long enough to, to prevail. Hmm. These are good points. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, watch out for that, that crazy game. I'll watch the video. <clears throat> it's, it's crazy. Um, so the next thing we're gonna go over is an, uh, we're gonna answer a question from the audience. Someone's asking, what are your thoughts on possession versus property ownership in regards to land? Jordan says, I'm probably in favor of some kind of use right theory myself, but I'm not decided either way. Trying to get the opinions of others in the anarchic spectrum. Use right, I guess, technically means summed up. As long as we're utilizing the land, we can possess it. If we're not, then we should let others possess it without battling over it since it's wrong to needlessly hog natural resources. He sent in uh, an accompanying article to kind of help further explain what he means by this and to define, I guess, this, this position. So some anarchists value property as a guarantee for freedom and prosperity. These would be your anarcho-capitalists. Whereas other anarchists see property as a means of oppression and therefore wish to see it abolished completely. Those would be your, I call them commies. Uh, and the reason why, uh, and the way that they want to abolish this completely, they would have to oppress other people. The very same thing that they're advocating against, right? Uh, you'll find a lot of inconsistencies with, and commies, commies in that regards. Uh, for example, they'll say that uh, the police state is bad, horrible, uh, wretched. But it's okay if they enforce our minimum wage. Nah, you know, they're, they're, they can be on our side in that case. Um, so, I've, and that's what I've come to find after years and years of experience with that in terms of that. So, I mean, they're against <laughs> oppression, but they have no problem oppressing others with their point of view to see, to see it abolished. Um, so what, what do you guys think of that question? So that the use right there is pretty much saying like, if you're not using that cup and you put it down, I can come by and pick it up and drink out of that right now. All right, if you're eating an apple and you set it down, well, it's no longer in your possession. I can come now and pick it up and eat it myself, All right? So it doesn't really have a real respect for private property. I wouldn't, some people say, well, it's limited. It's like, I, you either respect private property or you don't. Um, and in terms of course and how they define some of the terms of property can be very not uh, consistent as well. Um, they would describe it very vaguely and abstractly with more abstract words and the definitions which requires more, more explaining. Well, if you, if you take a, an idea like that consistently, then it flies in the face of, of the nature of any animal. Um, like at every, every animal, as far as I know, um, has a sense of property, has a sense of, okay, you know what, I forged for this or I caught this, you know, and unless, unless it's enough to kind of, you know, share it with the group, it, you don't take this, this is mine. I don't care if I've eaten half of it and put it down for a little bit, this is mine. All right. And generally when use rights type, uh, or, or when, uh, I can't speak of that specifically, but, but when that type of idea, um, goes down to that level, they say, well, no, of course you don't grab somebody's apple just because they put it down. You know, no, you don't take somebody's drink because they put it down. You know, that goes straight to rape. I mean, this might be right. a jump, yeah. but that goes straight to rape. If somebody puts their drink down, walks away, then, oh, well, that's not actually their drink. You can put a roofie in it. Right. Why not? You know, so and if you look at something like that, then how can that you know, this is an idea that's that's put forward by a lot of, you know, commie types. Right. And they're also, they tend to be very social justice warrior. Right. So how does that not clash? How does that not break? Because you're not being consistent. Right. 
Uh, I came across one person who advocated something like this at Occupy. I was only there for a week. I uh, had to get out <laughs> after that. Uh, and he had this, he was just talking, like, I don't believe in property rights. And you, you know, I said, like, all right, well, what is it that you believe? And it's like, it's personal stuff. And uh, he set down um, his phone next to them. And I just picked it up. I was like, oh, cool. And he's like, there's a cool phone. It's like, great, I have two now. <laughs> it's awesome. And then he got, he got you know, it's like, oh, uh, could I? Uh, he, he didn't want to use like possessive words to denote his, his, his ownership now. Because now he's just like, oh, but now it's mine. Now I have ownership over this, uh, this object. And uh, he put out his hand, he was trying to, uh, you know, kind of reaching out for it, and I smacked his hand away, and he told him, you know, you touch me, I'm gonna hurt you, right? <laughs> don't, don't touch me. Uh, and what, what is it that you, that you want, right? It's like, he tried very hard not to use uh, words that they note ownership, like it's mine, or it belongs to me. Um, and then after a while, I'm like standing up, looking and walking away, and just frustrated, and I just kind of put it back on the ground, and uh, it was, you know, quickly snatched it up, put it in his pocket. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's kind of where this goes to. Uh, it's no area in which like you can put something down even for a second without warning that someone will just come by and pick it up for themselves. But just to be clear, at what point um, can you no longer claim absentee ownership? That is where they're trying to go with this with land. So that's a good point. Um, and which where they want to see this. So for example, I think a lot of the, the issues when they bring it up is a distraction. Uh, for example, here in Richmond, you have, uh, you can lose your home if your property is considered blight. If it's, you know, looks like it's falling apart. Uh, the local political gangs here will find you. If you don't pay that, they'll put a lien on your house and then they'll, they'll take it from you, right? Of course, the city of Richmond has nearly 1,800, 1,800 properties that are blighted themselves. And of course, who, who can take that away from them, right? You know, so the city outnumbers in terms of like the number of blighted properties. There's a lot of blighted properties here that uh, no one's allowed to homestead because uh, the criminal grand gangs here, the thieves and murderers, will shoot you if you dare homestead that unused or unowned property. Uh, same thing with the federal government gang, gang here per, that prevents you from homesteading nearly 650 million acres of land. That's nearly one third of all the land area across the United Tax Firms of America. That's a lot of land. And I think a lot of this contention with commies think that there's not a lot of land for everyone. It's like, it's very difficult. It's like, there's a lot of land to homestead. There's a lot of land for you to have your own little commune and do what you will with your experiment, right? <laughs> uh, as long as it's voluntary and consensual. And you know, there's no one really fighting. You'll go on a plane and travel out west and look out your window, a lot of land out there. Uh, but we're just not allowed to homestead it. We'll be shot if we did. And so I think that's, the solution there, they're, they're distracted thinking that it's so tight niche, it's like the whole idea, like the world's overpopulated thing, right? Mm -hmm. You can fit the entire population in the world in New Zealand or in Texas. Uh, you know, these sort of myths only resolve into having one solution, that's government. You know, pretty much government either uh, for sterilization or murdering people because we're overpopulated. And same thing with this idea that there's not enough land out there. Um, so I think what a lot of people don't come to, I guess, try not, I guess something you should understand, like why we advocate for property rights uh, is to one simple reason, to avoid conflict, conflict, right? to, to resolve these conflict disputes over scarce resources. Uh, resources, property defined as something that's tangible, something that's real, uh, something that's scarce, rivers, two people want it at the same time. And of course, if there's a claim over the title of this phone, for example, or a plot of land out there, we've resolved it two, two simple ways, right? The first person who owns dead of that, you know, is the legitimate owner. Whereas it's like if I have a, a land out there and I build a fence, I build my house, <laughs> I've lived there for, for, for several years, and Isaac comes around, it's like, no, that's mine now. <laughs> well, how do we resolve this conflict dispute? You know, it seems that the first person who was there on that land and homesteaded, it's, that belongs to him or her. Um, you know, that's the most ethical way and justifiable way to resolve that dispute. Or whether it was through a voluntary transaction trade, right? You, you traded the title of a sum of money or Bitcoin for that plot of land in that house, right? That was voluntary, that was consensual. The title exchanges were, were I guess you both profited from that, uh, versus the claim over someone else saying, well, that's my house. It's like, well, did you get here first? No. Uh, how did you claim title ship owners, owner of this house? Uh, you, you don't have that. <laughs> now you're just trying to really just to steal it from you, right? 
And there's only the only other way that people can try to do that is to the threats of violence, um, putting in guns to your face, <laughs> trespassing. Um, I don't know any other way outside of uh, those two legitimate ways, the most uh, ethical ways, I would say, to resolve those conflict disputes than uh, the first person homesteaded or through voluntary exchange. Uh, you could then, you're going to mention, what if, what if there's the property is still dilapidated in that community? Well, in that community, you still have rules, right? So I'll move in a community that says, in the event you abandon your home, and have done nothing with it for 20 years, uh, you know, you leave it up for an auction or something like that, right? And that could be something you explicitly give your consent to if, if that were to occur, right? Um, so you could have ways to kind of still work with that, but not in a way it's like, well, yeah, you haven't, I haven't seen you in your house for like a week now, so I'm gonna come by <laughs> and take it over. And there are areas where squatting is actually legal too, which is somewhat terrifying. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you have areas like in California, uh, government enforcing uh, the commie thing where like if someone, there's an incident where like this family just got this nanny or this, this maid to help them out and said, well, here's a room for you, you can stay here as well. And, uh, and then she stopped working. And then uh, and it's like, well, you know, come on, what are you doing? And then she just didn't, didn't care. It's like, well, you, you're gonna have to leave now. She's like, you're not honoring the terms of our contract agreement. And uh, she, didn't, she didn't leave, because apparently in California, she could stay there for as long as she wants. <laughs> I think up to three months, I believe. Uh, and so they have to give her a letter of uh, that you know, she has to be removed. Uh, and then it takes, and here in Virginia, it's the same thing. It takes a month and a day after you submit a letter, and then you have to get the sheriff to come in here to remove an unwelcome guest from your home. Um, and there's a lot of people who have problems with that all the time. And, uh, you know, there's no real respect for private property there. And if someone's really hurting to have a home, then the first thing you want to do is abolish government <laughs> so that all these abandoned property that they own could be homesteaded themselves, right? So they can squat there instead and make a living there instead of making yours a living hell, so to speak. Um, so I, that's uh, the distinction of like possession of or versus uh, property rights. Uh, it's always difficult to get a commie to nail down a precise definition of that. Um, I guess you could say with much with a lot of things, but if the definition like for property is, yeah, this is a very good definition, right? It's something that anyone can kind of universally apply and, and measure. Uh, it makes sense, right? Ideas, therefore, are not property. Ideas are not tangible. They're not real. Um, they're infinite, right? Anyone can, once someone has an idea, you know, this, it's not scarce anymore. Uh, and that's probably a topic for another discussion in terms of IP, but yeah, in terms of uh, this portion, which is generally uh, an ANCOM thing. Um, yeah, I, th those are my thoughts. I, I don't, <laughs> I'm not, uh, I don't advocate for that. Um, I advocate either for, for real respect for private property, um, full self ownership, right? Um, this is, uh, you know, like this is your shirt, <laughs> those are your pants, that's your money, <laughs> that's uh, your body. Or, you know, or if this is your land, that would be your land. This is your house. Um, whereas under government, uh, they say otherwise, right? I mean, a domain said that's not your land. Property taxes said that's not your house. Our laws and <laughs> legislating, which you can't kind of put in your body, says that your body does not belong to you. Mm -hmm. And use to right property seems to kind of indicate the same thing whenever anyone feels like, well, you're not using that, so I'm just going to go ahead and take it, right? And it's probably important to reiterate that in a free society, you would be able to have uh, whatever sort of system you would like to have set up in your own community. That's right, true. Uh, you know, if it fails, it fails. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the, the market for good ideas went out on that. Uh, it's not something that I, I myself advocate for, right? Uh, so if, if that's something that uh, you think could work out, as long as it's voluntary consensual, go for it. Uh, when it starts to fail, uh, ask my name at the, at the gate and I'll help you find a real home that people will respect your stuff <laughs> and you won't have these strangers coming in all the time taking your stuff. For a modest fee. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll help you up. You know, I'll help you get a job and all that stuff. So uh, Cal asks for me uh, and so you good, good to go. And then you say, yeah, that was a horrible idea. What was I thinking? Um, well, that's, that's, re that's really a... Um a litmus, a litmus test of, of whether or not you have a real free society is does it tolerate other societal constructs? So does anarcho-communism tolerate a capitalist society within, you know, the world, basically? And no, it doesn't. Um, 
But anarcho-capitalism, voluntarism, which which are arguably synonyms, do. Right. You can have a mutualist commune. You can have a you know ancom commune. You can have a um, a Venus project. And in fact, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there were little Venus projects cropping up in an, in a voluntarist world. And they would probably you know be involved with the transhumanists in some ways. Yeah. And it would be great. But just don't force your technocracy your technocracy on me because right. I don't necessarily want to listen to what a computer tells me to do. Right. Uh, no, that's that's a good valid point. That goes back uh, to like the article that was like trying to talk about use rights and that uh, they seek to abolish it completely. Uh, and the only way to do that is to create a state. The only way to do that is to become a political ruler yourself, and you become the very thing that you start off. Pretending you advocated against, uh, so yeah, I don't, I don't. That's why I just call them communists. I don't really find consistency with that. Um, anarchy means without political rulers, right? <laughs> that's that, with its own definition means without not becoming one yourself, um, as I've seen a lot of incomes do. So I mean, that's so that's you know you can have your use right thing and, and figure that out. It's not something I'll ever uh, advocate for myself. Um, I'm not going to advocate something that fails and hurts people. But you're more than welcome to try. So <laughs> with that, uh, we'll go to some uh, wrap-ups. Was that a good wrap-up with that one? Yeah, okay, that's no. great. Cool. All right, so if you want to help put together the best anarchist show that is uh, News from Underground, there's several ways you can do to do that. You can go check out our Amazon wish list, as mentioned uh, early in the beginning of the video. Uh, for example, we have a YouTube user, Invisible. AZ DJ, he's going to donate uh, one of the Yeti mics for us. You know, we're going to have at least, which is great, which is like the best thing ever. So we can have two here on the side. I have a mic here. So that way we can have great audio and, you know, for the eventual upload on iTunes that we're going to do. And so that's all, all that helps. Every little bit helps. Uh, you can, of course, like this video if you enjoyed it and share our content, right? There's a lot of, uh, you know, trying to shave, change the paradigm shift towards uh, real media that's objective in terms of that, you know, aside from all this status uh, interpretation, like the polls, for example, that we were talking about earlier. Uh, eventually, of course, you, you can send us your questions, right? Uh, in terms of like what you like to hear from what the anarchist perspective and trying to solve any kind of questions you have. Right? Eventually we'll have a call-in show as well. Make it an argument. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, of course the donation of equipment, uh, books for the Satoshi Library here we have, uh, and even financial support will give you a sponsorship credit at the end of every video. Right? It'll, it'll come and appear after uh, Johnny's outro music. It's like the best outro ever. And with that, uh, hopefully you guys enjoy the show. And again, thank you so much for your support. And with that, see you guys at the Victory Party. I'm Cat Moloney. Isaac Markison. And Phil, the anarchistician. Take good care. Yeah.